Hi, everybody. Oh, now I'm very loud. Uh, this is uh, Elevating Cloud Native Education. Uh, so in other words, we're going to talk a little bit about uh, how we feel like uh, cloud native development and cloud kind of computing is not usually well represented, especially in an undergraduate degree in universities these days, and hopefully what we're trying to do to solve that problem. Uh, so uh, we're actually going to lead the talk with Anwisha talking about uh, wh what she walked into industry with, or lack thereof, uh, and then kind of you know pair that with what we're trying to accomplish. Uh, so just by way of introduction, I'm Langdon White, and this is Anwisha. Uh, and uh, in case you couldn't tell us apart, here's our pictures. Um, but then I come from about 15 years of boutique software consulting, then about a nine years or so at Red Hat, and then I've spent the last uh, two or three years at Boston University as a clinical professor, uh, and Anwisha. Um, hi, guys. Um, so I'm pretty nervous. This is my first time talking at a conference. Um, so I'm a grad student currently. I used to work at Oracle as a software developer for three years after my undergrad. Um, and then currently, I just finished my master's degree. I'm going to be defending my thesis next month. And I'm also an incoming student to the PhD program. Um, so my work, like a little about my research, is that I work on systems, which means technically like networking and distributed systems, streaming systems. And my research area specifically is on database optimization. So I tune databases. And I work on like auto-tuning. Um, on specifically this thing called log structured merge trees, which is like super popular now. Um, there's things like DynamoDB, uh, RocksDB, which is what I concentrate on, and LevelsDB, um, things like that. Um, so I work with this really nice guy called Manos, um, who's pretty, pretty in the field of like database research. Um, and that's a little about me. Um, my experience in cloud is quite limited, but um, well, that's why I'm here. So I'm still like kind of struggling to learn cloud. I've just gotten into it, um, and then we'll just I'll just share like what I've gone through. Next slide. Okay. So this is a little about like my experience at Oracle. Um, I started out as a software developer, which if anyone else has started out as one, um, my role was not very clearly defined. I worked on something called Oracle Jet, uh, which was our cool other language, which we were trying to put our whole UI, transform our whole UI into. Um, and then uh, slowly I got kind of tired of it, so I moved into more like in stuff, which was like the Oracle Cloud when I was working for Oracle. So I worked for the Oracle Cloud infrastructure, but my product was a legacy product, which means that we couldn't build things again like using microservices. We just wanted to deploy it on the cloud. So the two cloud infrastructures that we um, concentrated on was OCI, which was our own cloud, Oracle's cloud, and then Azure. Um, and then what I was given, um, which maybe people can relate to, I was a fresher, so I didn't have any idea about what to do. I was given access, and I was told, like, go ahead and deploy things. Um, this is your RPM package. This is your cloud. Go and do it. Um, so I went through the interface, and I had no idea what a shape was, um, whether I needed backup, what were subnets. I didn't know how things communicated with each other. So I just like, kind of came back with questions. I was like, what, what is this? I've just run things on a VM. I don't know what a cloud VM is. Um, so that's, uh, that's how I started out. And then I was finally able to deploy things on the cloud. Um, and then I continued with the cloud. I ran several um, performance benchmarks um, because I used to work on OJET. Um, we had this API speed testing and stuff. So I also worked a little on Microsoft Teams. Um, but then like, I still had questions because when they teach you things in industry, they don't teach you why you do stuff. They teach you like the steps of how you do it. So I just did that. I just knew that you had to click this button and just be like, oh, this is your region. And I just didn't know why I was doing things, basically. Um, so I went back home, and um, I wanted to go into this other team, which was kind of the cool team, which was based on the microservice level of architecture. So I wanted to learn Kubernetes and microservices and Docker. Um, so I went back and did my research. I learned all about it. I learned the theory stuff of it, and I came back. And then I was told that you need actual practical experience to get into this team. And the nice part about that team was they got, like, MacBook Pros, and I was given a ThinkPad. So I just wanted to go there because I was... I was young, and I just wanted cool things. Um, so well, that was my primary motivation. I obviously didn't get into that team, and I stayed in my team, but moving on. 
Um, so which brings us to the issue that we have is that what often you learn from like textual reading or like videos is not really what you are going to be experiencing. So when I started out with like doing videos, I had no idea what issues you could run into because they gave me something which worked absolutely fine. So what I learned as a software developer was more often than not, things did not ever work out. So which brings us to the fact that you need more practical experience than theoretical experience. Um, so this is my experience as a grad student. Um, I did, I tried getting into cloud. Um, I've always tried getting into cloud because I thought it was new and cool and I could run things which I couldn't otherwise because I didn't have enough you know, space infrastructure, I guess. Um, so I took the streaming systems class because I was a very systems oriented person. I've always been into databases. And um, this is my professor. I was super like fascinated with her, so I put her picture over there. Um, if anyone knows her, she works on Flink, um, and she's a contributor to the open source repository. She works on graphic, uh, graphical, I think the library, whatever, whichever deals with graphs. And I worked on her on a project which, went, which was going to be dip, like done using AWS Lambda. And I was just given this project that like, if, you, if, if anyone's ever used like a streaming systems pipeline, which is like, you have this incoming traffic at sudden times, and then your pipeline basically gets overloaded. So you have something called back pressure, which makes everything much slower. So our idea was that when you have something which is causing issues in your pipeline, you want to use something which is readily available. So AWS Lambda was a serverless function, and I, we just wanted to use that, because you could just use it and then forget about it. For me, I, I was just getting started with Flink. So Flink was hard for me to understand, and I had no idea what a serverless function meant. So I didn't know that you could just like call it using HTTP um, methods and then just like forget about it. I didn't know anything about it. So I was given this part of like um, invoking the Lambda function using my Flink pipeline, and I got super stuck. And that's when I started reading about like everything that AWS had to offer in terms of cloud. Yeah, um, so the next thing I did was like an um, internship. I worked, I started working with Professor Langdon um, and that was primarily because like I wanted experiential learning. And um, what, what Langdon works on sort of in our, at BU is um, a sort of lab, which is like, which tries to cover this difference between what you learn in class and what you want to learn, you know, at work. Like when you go to work, you have certain things, like people expect you to know certain things which they don't teach you in academia. So when I first started working, they just like threw a bunch of stuff at me and expected me to know it the next day. And I, I really wanted to help other people like get over that. So I joined this um, organization. And um, Langdon actually has a really cool subject, which is like we take projects from clients and we try to build solutions which are like built by students. But the, the issue is here that the more freedom you give, the more choices you have. So students had to decide their own tech stack. They had to decide how they would deploy it. They had to make arguments for it. And most people didn't know. Like undergrad, at, at an undergrad level, I had no idea what I was going to be using. And I didn't know the pros and cons of that. So um, I joined this group to be able to work on this. Um, and then I started working on this project called uh, CCAN. It's a, it's a data management system. And what it does essentially is that if you have um, data available to you, like publicly available data, it helps you like host it, store it, and display it. It has its own like theming libraries and you can just use it out of the box. So a lot of government websites actually use it. Um, in fact, the Boston uh, government also uses it. And that's a bunch of like websites which use it. And it's pretty cool if you guys wanna do it. Um, and then, I had this experience and I thought it was pretty cool. So I wanted to get into more like open source stuff. And then I started working more and more with uh, Spark and I also started working as a TA. Um, coming back to our discussion um, about the experiential learning lab, um, the issue we faced was that students were not aware of like tech stacks and things to use and how do you deploy apps? Like what is Cloudflare, what is Vercel? Why should I use one over the other? If BU sponsors most of my things, I can just use the most expensive thing ever. So um, that's why we introduced another course, which would be a precursor, which teaches you practical things, more like why would you choose something over something else? Why would you use some other database? Why would you use Postgre over some other something? So 
That's why um, I became the TA for that course. I've been working as a TA for almost a year now. And I work with Langdon a lot, so I put his picture up there, just so that you know that it's associated with him. And that's our first class that we had. Um, that's a picture of all of them. And that's the Spark logo, just for reference. Yeah. Um, so that's like pretty much all for my part. For like summing up exactly what I mean by ex sharing all of my experiences with you is that um, this has been my experience over like a very long period of time. So I did my undergrad, I finished it in 2019. I worked as a developer for three years, a master's degree of two years, and I'm still here and I, I don't think I can confidently say that I know everything about cloud at all. So, um, which brings us to the point that like, when I talk to the people from the industry at this conference, um, there is a lot that I get to learn like from scratch because um, current academic syllabus does not ever cover what exactly you need to know about cloud. And there's so much about cloud. There's like deploying on cloud, there's building the cloud, and there's so many other aspects of cloud. So um, we propose a sort of practical learning as opposed to the theoretical learning that we've all come to know, which is the syllabus. And that's what Langdon is going to be talking about. So. Oh, okay, I have another slide. Um, so these are the things that I assumed would be taught in a cloud native class, because these are things that I had no idea about. Uh, one was cloud deployment, because I didn't know what deployments meant when I started out. One was containerization, which is the most important part of the cloud, because I wanted to run my program anywhere I wanted it to. And orchestration tools, which you cannot understand unless you know what containerization is. So I started, um, figuring out what orchestration meant, which is not something which you learn about either. So these are the three things I assume would be covered, but I'll let Langdon speak for what exactly he's going to be doing. Thank you. So yeah, uh, so my own experience with my students, right, is, uh, you know, uh, actually I have a class this semester, for example, that I was uh, doing data engineering at scale. And I, the first thing I did, first day of class, was kind of give a Python quiz. And I was terrified by the response on the quiz. Um, you know, so the, the kind of tactical hands-on experience uh, component, you know, what you're often taught in a lot of uh, kind of CS programs in general is uh, kind of like how to program, right? Or how to find algorithms, but not all the other things that surround kind of software engineering. Right, or software development, which is all those things like deployment and how do you, you know, like what is a container? Um, you know, many of my students actually have never even used or seen a virtual machine. They don't even know exactly what they are. Uh, so, you know, like when I, in almost all my classes, when I want to explain containers, I have to start with, okay, well, back in the day, we had these physical servers and this is the problems, right? And then I kind of lead into virtual machines and then I lean into containers. And then sometimes for the more advanced classes, right? Then I can start to talk about, okay, now I have all these containers running around. I need some way to keep track of them, right? And so I talk about orchestration and Kubernetes. But that's really hard, right? There's a lot there. Um, and so we have these challenges. And so what we decided to try to do was actually can we get a collaborative group of people together to focus on, sorry, go back one more, sorry, um, to focus on kind of these things. But we have to talk about them in terms of academia. So like every other vertical, right, you know, I worked a lot in sort of like the financial services space, um, you know, so I know a lot about like options and put, you know, polls and trades and, you know, all those kinds of things. Um, and I also did a lot in pharmaceutical. What I've found since I've been in academics uh, is that they have their own lingo, right? They have their own stuff that you need to be able to talk about it in terms of words like pedagogy, right? Which I know had never come up for me until I started getting involved in the university um, or things like learning outcomes. And so we wanna make sure that the content that we produce is kind of consumable by the people who we want to teach these things. So we started a working group um, basically uh, towards the end of last summer uh, called the Higher Ed Working Group. It's within the CNCF. Um, and you know, if you wanna check out our charter, that's where that QR code goes. The QR code will also be at the end, so you don't have to grab it now. Um, but we have meetings every two weeks and we've started to get some faculty members to show up on the regular and start to actually contribute to some of this content. Um, and, but that kind of leads into some of the challenges, which is, and I'm gonna talk about these a little out of order because the one leads to the other. So ultimately, right, what we want is adoption, okay? We want our content, our, our work to be adopted, like every other open source project, essentially, right? Um, 
So that is going to lead us to how we create the thing. And then lastly, we have an, also a bunch of challenges around distribution that are not typical for uh, kind of an open source software project. You know, most of the ones I've been involved in, you know, you, you put out an RPM, right? Or you put out a container. This has got some other problems, and we'll talk about those in a sec. All right, so uh, first and foremost, um, we have to consider how, like, a faculty member, and when I say a faculty member, I kind of mean at a community college or an R1 university like Boston University or at a, you know, a liberal arts college or whatever. In a lot of ways, academics are very similar, irrelevant of where they're teaching. And typically, they, um, you know, uh, has anybody ever heard of Not Invented Here? Um, that NIH belief, uh, there's a lot of that in academics, uh, where as, a, as an instructor, um, the default is I don't really use anybody else's things. I always kind of create my own, uh, which I find really odd, right? Especially now that I've been kind of heavily embedded in open source for a long time, I am happy to take other people's stuff and adapt it to what I need, right? Uh, and so, but that's not pretty typical. So if I shipped a whole class that said, this will teach your students cloud native development and, you know, magic will happen afterwards, there's very few people who would adopt it. So instead, we're going to focus it more on kind of the individual units of a lecture so that we can give people like a piece that they can tie into an existing class or use pieces of it to tie into, you know, a new class that they're creating, but they're still in a lot of control over the content. And then related to that, um, a lot of the faculty members that we're targeting also don't really know about this cloud stuff. Uh, so in general, uh, we kind of have to be sneaky, right? Like we have to kind of do a lot of this stuff kind of on the down low so that we can distribute it, um, but in such a way that other people will consume it, like that the people we want to use it will actually be able to adopt it. Um, so moving on to the next slide. So we have these kind of lecture units. Um, I am awful at naming things. Anybody who's familiar with my work in Fedora uh, is well aware of my major project and it's terrible naming. Uh, so we haven't come up with a good name yet, um, but what we've tried to do is come up with a template for the content. And this is, and I know you can't read it, but you know, basically it, it includes all those kind of academic important things, okay? So something like learning outcomes. Learning outcomes are often with a syllabus or even with an individual lecture where this is what I as the instructor am in trying to ensure that the students come out of it with. Right? And you often won't share the learning outcomes with the students, but when I'm talking to another academic, it's really, really important that we talk about it in terms of what is the outcome we want for the student, because how we get there, you know, it's, it's, a, it's a very sophisticated kind of speaking model, right? Where we actually want the uh, students or whatever to walk away with a particular set of knowledge. And so that's how we kind of rate a piece of, uh, like a lecture. And so I might be talking to somebody else and say, hey, these are, these are the learning outcomes I expect for this thing. So we'll include that. We also want to include things like uh, in-class assignments, right? Or homework assignments. We want in-class assignments, right? Because a 90-minute uh, lecture is boring for everyone, right? So it's often you try to put something in the middle to kind of break it up. Um, you know, it's why conference talks tend to be 30 minutes, right, instead of an hour and a half long, because nobody likes to sit still that long, and so you want to break up your class, and so we want to make sure that the content is there for them to break up the class, so it's easy to adopt as possible. Um, and then kind of also the requirements, and this is where we get the piece about how do we, how do we teach the teacher, so um, we can kind of put in a lot in the requirements of this is what the students should know before you give this lecture, and that also informs the instructor of what they need to know before they give this lecture, right? Uh, so we're doing some of those things. And then what this also allows us to do is adopt kind of prior art. There's a lot of people who've given a lot of talks at conferences, you know, in classes, in whatever, that might be great fits for, uh, you know, the kind of this open source initiative. Anybody who wants to contribute, we really want your stuff. And if you don't have it kind of in the, you know, academic ready format, that's where we have a few faculty members, you know, or even a lot of faculty members who we can kind of add that in, right? So we can go collect that prior art and then kind of encapsulate it in a way that is consumable. Um, and then, uh, and then there's, of course, marketing. Like, so then we have to kind of talk about it, right? So hence, for example, speaking at KubeCon. Um, but in other ways as well, we need to go to academic conferences and talk about the stuff there so that, uh, you know, we can actually, you know, uh, meet our target market. 
All right, and then the last thing is distribution. So distribution, you know, there's, there's kind of all the typical problems of like, how do you make somebody aware that it exists? But we have weirder problems, right? Is that, for example, like a homework assignment, I don't want to put all of the answers in public, right? Because I want the students to have to figure out the homework assignment. So uh, there's prior art on this. There's, a, for example, a class out of Berkeley. The way they do it is they kind of certify you as a faculty member and uh, then only release that content to you. So it's still kind of open source, but it's not quite the same thing, right? It's not just open, it's not just available. There's other tricks we can do here too, where we get more sophisticated, where the, the assignment is actually generated based on the actual student. But those are obviously, like I said, more sophisticated and harder to build, but it's this huge challenge we have where we can't just release everything because, you know, we don't want to give out the answers, we want to just give them the questions. So that's a, that's a problem and kind of difficult in the spirit of traditional open source. The other big problem we have is that the, almost all the tools involved, from presentation tools to, um, you know, classroom management tools like Blackboard or Canvas or Gradescope, those are all closed source as well, right? They're all proprietary. So it's difficult to um, kind of release content in a way they can consume because unfortunately, to the best of my knowledge, LibreOffice and Press has not pervaded everyone, right? So I can't ship ODP files and expect anyone to use them. So this is another challenge is like we need to ship the content in somewhat proprietary formats or figure out ways that we can go to get around that issue, right? You know, one example might be Reveal, but Reveal has its own problems for, you know, a not technically sophisticated faculty member, right? So we have a bunch of problems that are, I would say, atypical for, for an open source project that make our distribution really difficult. But that's kind of where we're at. That's kind of what we've been doing a little bit. Um, and what we have next um, is the kind of, you know, building more of these units, obviously. But then at some point, we do want to have kind of, a, you know, a list with maybe a syllabus that actually says, okay, here is an actual class and here are all the lectures because it's nice to be able to have a backbone to a class so that you understand how the pieces all fit together, even if we don't really expect anyone to adopt it uh, kind of as a unit. Um, it'll at least give some nice backbone to the content so that we know what, uh, what like kind of the whole thing and how it all comes together. Um, actually, go back one. Um, and then another thing that we really want to incorporate is experiential learning, right? So Anusha talked a lot about, you know, kind of that practical, tactical aspect, particularly about doing a project for a third party. You know, it's very difficult to come up with projects that you use like in a class that is, you know, manufactured that has all the same problems that it does the second you have a customer right, or a client, um, you know, about negotiating scope and things like that, which is one of the things that we try to teach in some of those Spark classes, right? So the Spark classes, they do software engineering projects for third parties. They, it's, it's actually really funny, almost every semester, we'll have students come to us and be like, okay, what's the rubric for the project? How do I know if I'm gonna get a good grade? And I tell them, I don't know. You need to negotiate that with the client and you need to figure out how to make the client happy. And when the client is happy, you will get a good grade. If the client is unhappy, they will not. This is a very weird thing, especially for students at a, you know, a relatively, you know, high school where, you know, everyone's been doing all their coursework all their lives to get, you know, straight A's or whatever. And when I tell them, no, I don't have an answer for you, it really freaks them out. But I think it's a lot more like the experience all of you have had in the industry, right? So uh, that's been really interesting. Um, and then kind of the last thing in parallel, just the past couple of weeks, um, I've been working with somebody in the OpenSSF who's also involved in the higher ed working group um, to look at uh, something called like accreditation. So um, it is common for there to be organizations that uh, kind of accredit a university's program for whatever, right? And so what they're looking at um, basically with the Linux Foundation and with uh, CNCF and OpenSSF is how can we say, okay, and they open SSF, uh, if you're not familiar, is focused on security. So they want to say, if you have classes that meet these criteria, we're going to give you an accreditation that says you are, this student who took those classes is prepared for working in cybersecurity, right? What we want to do is actually something very similar, and we're doing it kind of collaboratively, 
you take these series of classes and you're prepared to work in cloud native development. So it's kind of just another ratification. And while kind of on the face of it, the student may or may not ever use the fact that it was accredited, uh, like to get them a job or something like that. What a school can do though is use it to differentiate themselves from other schools to say, hey, we have a set of classes that will prepare our students for jobs in cybersecurity or jobs in cloud native development. And so that's why we've been pursuing this accreditation activity um, and uh, really looking forward to that. Uh, in case you're wondering about these photos, uh, this is the, uh, if you have seen it, the, it's often referred to as the Jenga building in Boston. Uh, this is when it was getting built and I got a hard hat tour early on. Uh, but so under construction, except it's an actual building that I have an office in now. Um, and so that's about all there is for our talk. Uh, we had, um, you know, we would like to take any questions that you might have. All right. Oh, sorry. Correct. Although it's more like 25, but yeah. Yeah. So, so the question. All right, so I'm gonna paraphrase for the mic. So, um, so the question is basically like, uh, how did I get from working in industry to work in academia, right? Um, and so uh, it's actually got a relatively long history, mostly related to medicine and lawyers. Uh, if you think about it, lawyers and doctors don't actually have PhDs. So technically speaking, they actually can't teach at a university. So if you want a medical doctor to be able to teach medicine at a medical school, they have to have a separate role. And that role is called a clinical professor. And you've started to see clinical professorships uh, spread out, basically, beyond law and medicine. Uh, so for example, there's journalism schools now that actually hire journalists as professors, but they are clinical professors. Um, that's a common one. Social work is another really common one. And you're starting to see it in tech. And so my credibility as being a professor is because I'm a clinical professor. And so my 25 years of experience is why I have the credibility to teach. But I can't be tenure track, so. Oh, sure, yeah. Can you hear? Ah. Yeah. So uh, thank you very much for a wonderful presentation. Also, congratulations on Lesha. It was really inspiring. Um, my, it will be rather a comment, but I think you will add something on top of it. Um, let's face one detail. You are coming from top-notch of academia, like Boston itself is a um, collection of most prestigious universities, institutions in the world, um, it's the first city that comes to my mind. And um, when I was watching, your, um, like following your presentation, I was thoughtful, how can, we, uh, how can we relate to this actually to academia in developing countries, right? Like how can we bring it up to that level um, that, that they can come somewhere near because in developing countries there is actually kind of a dilemma that I, I know a lot of young people, they want to be computer scientists, they want to be developers, but they believe, similarly, they believe uh, university is a waste of time, that I would rather work for four years, get four years of experience, and I would get better salary, better career, and so on. So how do we challenge that? Uh, in the end, it's a question, and thank you. So, yeah, so this goes a lot to the philosophy of it, and I would argue that um, there's a lot of places even in the U.S. that are not Boston, right? Um, and so there's this challenge, this dichotomy between, like, what is the role of higher ed, right? Um, and a lot of people who are going to, you know, higher ed, whatever, you know, community college, you know, liberal arts school, university, in, you know, in the U.S. or in other parts of the world, it doesn't really make any difference. There's this kind of expectation that they're going to the university for, um, to go get a job afterwards in industry, say, right? That's not entirely the goal of a university, right? What they're actually typically selling is um, a, an understanding of the, um, of the science, right, or of the computer science, you know, or the political science, or the whatever, you know, it's pretty universal, where the reason you're going to that four-year degree is to give you context. 
and then you're doing a master's degree, typically a terminal master's degree, where that is gonna give you the tactical experience that will go and help you into a job. You kind of have the other end of the spectrum, which is like a coding camp, which is basically trying to prepare you purely tactically with very little context. And I think both routes are actually kind of tough, especially with software development, uh, because I don't know that you need five years to be prepped to work in industry. So I think that's where we have this, this dichotomy. You know, if you, were, if you were in medicine, for example, we have several thousand years of stuff that you need to learn over the course of, you know, typically, you know, eight-ish years of uh, degree. And it makes a lot of sense. But our field, it's like 100 years old, right? We just don't have that much content. And so I think that's where a lot of the disconnect is, is that, you know, you're going for like kind of this practical application, but the but you probably may not, or you may not need to do that in five years. Um, and then kind of on the flip side of it, I think the, the challenge that we're really trying to address, which is not the core fundamental, are, are the people who are buying an education and the people selling an education trying to do the right, like are they buying and selling the right thing, but more um, that I actually believe that even in a theoretical scenario, you have to have these wider concepts around, you know, and, and you see them in some schools, right? Like distributed computing, um, you know, my big thing is actually event-driven architectures that, you know, I think everything should be event-driven, um, you know, et cetera, that are still not really taught even, even the theory of it, much less the tactical component. Uh, so I think the tactical component actually gives um, more context to the theoretical stuff as well. So that's what we're trying to solve for, but I completely hear your point. It's just, it's a, it's kind of like a, a, it is a problem. I'm not sure if it's one that will ever quote unquote be solved as much as what we're gonna see is an evolution of how software developers are created, right? Is that, is there gonna be different ways to do it? Um, and because like I said, I, I think we don't, we don't really have a good answer on either side of that house yet. Um, you know, we don't have enough theory in coding camps and we don't have enough tactical in universities. So that is a big open question and not one we entirely want to address. Sorry, back there. First it's very of all, hard to see you, just FYI. <laughs> first of all, thank you for coming. It's very uncommon to see people from academia to come to the industry events like uh, KubeCon. I want to tackle the topic of uh, stubbornness in academia. So basically, uh, I'm finishing my master's right now at the Delft University of Technology in the Netherlands. And in my department, I have two full professors which represent completely opposite spectrums of being open to changes in the industry. One of them gave us, gave us course where part of it was contributing to the open source code bases for example, by making the pull request, analyzing the software, and then presenting it. And another one is actively fighting student organizations who want to work with uh, entities outside of academia, like for example, big corporations, because there might be some involvement uh, of big corporations in academia. So it's kind of a purist approach. Um, from your, your experience, uh, how apparent it is and how often it happens that this stubbornness Stubbornness could be a problem in modifying uh, the academia curriculum because effectively uh, what we're talking about on this talk is that there would have to be introduced uh, the course of release engineering in addition to the software engineering because what most of the universities, even research ones, are tackling is how to create software but there is close to zero uh, discussion about how to actually make the software run no matter if it's uh, the infrastructure part and the ways of delivering it. So from your experience and talking to people in Boston University, for example, uh, how many of them do you think would be open for the change and how many of them are just too much locked in their uh, academia basement? So I don't really want to single out of school, um, but I completely agree with you. Uh, you know, I've, I've run into both a ton. You know, another big topic area that I don't think it's taught very well is debugging. 
um, right, is, you know, like when do you first learn how to do debugging? Uh, and that's, that's really difficult, even though you do it in your class, but if you want to do like an event-driven architecture and then try to debug across that, how do you even start, right? Uh, so I think there's, there's a lot of that resistance to change um, because, you know, first of all, with, it's somewhat with good reason, right? A lot of academics don't trust industry, right? Um, and, you know, and so sometimes they're right and sometimes they're wrong. Uh, so, but I think that's a big chunk of it. And then the other thing is it's, it's also very difficult to keep up, right? Um, you know, why are all of you here? You know, because if you work in software, right, you are constantly learning. Otherwise, you are done, right? Like, you just have to be building, 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 building. You can go and choose certain software, you know, development jobs where you don't need to worry about that too much. But that's, they're, I don't know if they're few and far between, but that's a very specific choice you're making. And I think it, you see the same kind of problem across faculty is you have some people who always want to be working with the bleeding edge, always want to be working with, you know, what's new and, you know, and building new classes and all these other things. And you have other people who are perfectly comfortable. They're doing a nine to five job and they are delivering on their nine to five job, but they don't really want to turn it into a nine to six job, right? So... I don't, I don't think that's li limited in any way to academia, but it is 100% there just like it is everywhere else. Uh, I also have a question that actually builds up uh, to the previous one. Uh, so what's your point of view of working together with companies? I, as a company, have also tried to collaborate with uh, universities, and there often I get the answer, oh, but there are so many companies who want to provide free training so they can re recruit the students. Right. My, my point of view is I want to provide knowledge and not recruit students, though recruiting students would be nice. Right. The primary focus is rec uh, providing knowledge because all of the companies are complaining about the fact that when someone graduates, they, know sh they don't know anything about what they need to know to actually be able to do the job. I appreciate your, uh, your catch on the correction there. Um, so... Yes, right. So the, the challenge a lot of times is a, is a in, you know, a, like some company, right, wants to provide something that's very specific about the knowledge that they want out of their, uh, you know, out of students coming into them. So that is often a big challenge. And so it's, it tends to be not very popular unless they find a faculty member who happens to really like working in that space or whatever. Um, so, but I think there are opportunities a lot to provide quote unquote knowledge, but they're usually um, less formal. So like, for example, our Spoke, Spark program, um, we take mentors from industry, we actually have a lot of instructors from industry, but they teach the classes I want them to teach. They don't teach a, you know, um, like, you know, I come from Red Hat, right? They don't teach a RHEL class, right? They teach a class about software development and doing it for clients. And if there is some Azure that gets into the mix or GCP or Red Hat or whatever, it's a byproduct of what's needed for the class. So I think a lot of people coming from industry in those formal programs tend to be kind of very, uh, you know, whatever, like blind, you know, uh, focused on just providing whatever their company wants to support. Um, but if you're, if you're kind of doing it from a, like I said, slightly less informal way, and it, it often still comes up, and that, that tactical knowledge is normally transferable, right? I mean, you know, just because I, you know, happen to learn some RHEL stuff in a class doesn't mean I can't apply it mostly, except for the awfulness of apt, uh, to Ubuntu and Debian, right? Um, so I think a lot of it kind of comes through. So I think there's, there are ways to do that. The other big thing that we do in experiential learning, particularly in the tech world, is becoming more and more popular. Um, and, but what we, we find is that our students gravitate towards working with nonprofits and working with like city government or state government where they kind of feel like they're having an impact on people. And so I think if you had a company or whatever who was kind of partnering with like a local nonprofit and doing projects for that local nonprofit, but the industry people, you know, the company people, right, are providing mentorship and things like that. I think that can be a better structured way. I just think the kind of typical formal mechanism that you see in a lot of companies now, um, you know, doesn't, doesn't really engage well with kind of the educational concept as much as it's doing, you know, kind of as you said, like, like work to train them on some tech. That said, hovering it as an offering where, you know, every Thursday you're going to buy pizza and, you know, do one of those tactical trainings, 
but it's not a class, that's a whole nother story, right? And we do things like that with like tech talks, you know, pretty regularly where we have somebody from industry come in and give a talk, et cetera, um, and we provide pizza because the only way you get students or engineers at something is by providing food, as you all well know. Um, so uh, that that would be my kind of thoughts. We're done. Oh, did you, sorry, Anusha is going to add something. Um, so I have some experience in academia. I want to say that there are professors who are genuinely interested in uh, industry. Um, my professor works a lot with Meta, so we use a lot of the Meta products, um, and we work on RocksDB, which they've made open source. It's not that they keep on contributing to it. We also sometimes contribute to it, but it works well because we sort of like contribute to their repo and they help us in return. But it also um, makes a difference. Like if you give us something which is attractive to us to just play with, like you are developing some software, you just give it to us and we just like try it out. And if we really like it, we actually use it in our research and that promotes your product and that also helps us because we're getting like free stuff. So a lot of the things we do, you, um, I think a lot of people give us like hardware to test out and then we just try it out in our lab and then we give you feedback on it. So it's not always that we, I think professors are very resistant towards industry tracks. Because I know like MIT has uh, Tim Kraska who works in databases, who's back in Amazon. Uh, my professor works with Meta. There's probably others who work for different companies. So I'm pretty sure they're pretty open if you can get the right interest and the right person to get that interest from. So yeah. All right, thank you very much. And apologies, I don't, I don't co-present a lot. Otherwise, I should have given more to Anwisha. Um, but uh, Thank you for coming. We are well over time, uh, and I don't want to get yelled at, so thanks. <laughs>